Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Devedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the uh, different aspects of the molecular biology. And so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the basic properties of a biological system. So in this context, we have discussed about the structure of the biological cells. So we have discussed about the structure of the prokaryotic cell and uh, we have discussed about the structure of eukaryotic cell. While we were discussing about the structure of eukaryotic cell, we have also discussed about the structure of the different organelles and their functions and their contribution into running the different types of uh, functions or the activities within the cell. In addition to that, in our previous lecture, we have also discussed about the cellular metabolism and how the cell is producing the energy with the help of the different types of catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. So, uh, uh, we have discussed about the, um, the anabolic reactions also which are responsible for production of the different types of biomolecules or the proteins. And then we also discuss about how uh, the cell is actually dividing and how what are the different stages it is actually going through. So, we have discussed about the cell cycle and how the cell cycle is tightly being regulated. Uh, while we were discussing about the cell cycle, we have also discussed about the some of the technical and uh, the as well as the experimental aspects, how you can be able to study the cell cycle with the help of the flow cytometry. In addition to that, we have also discussed about how you can be able to study the mitosis and meiosis with the help of the different types of microscopy techniques. And then uh, at the end, we have also discussed about the apoptosis and cell death. So, uh, and there also we have discussed about the different types of pathways. So, we have discussed about the intrinsic pathway and as well as the extrinsic pathway. What are different molecular players which are actually participating into these type of different pathways. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we have also seen how we can actually be able to study these events in the living cell uh, with the help of the uh, flow cytometry. So now uh, it is clear that uh, the uh, there are so many functions which are happening uh, or there are so many activities what is happening within the cell and all these activities if you summarize you will summarize that these activities can be classified into three different types of activities and all these activities can be summed up within the life related activities right so you can have the uh, life uh, related activities. So, first is uh, the production of energy, which means the catabolic reactions. We have discussed about the uh, carbohydrate uh, metabolism. And we have also discussed about the lipid metabolism and how the uh, glycolysis and Krebs cycle is contributing into the production of energy and how the beta oxidation is uh, taking place in the lipids and how it is actually producing the style CoA and then the style CoA is uh, getting into the Krebs cycle and producing the energy. The second aspect is about the growth, right? And as, we, as you remember that when we were using the energy, that energy can be used for producing the growth, right, with the help of running the anabolic reactions. And the third aspect is about reproduction, right. So growth is different from reproduction where the cell is actually going to perform the different types of uh, divisions right and that's how the single cell is actually going to multiply and becomes uh, double two cell four cell eight cell like that now what you see here is that the if you want to go with the catabolic reactions or the anabolic reactions or the reproduction of the reproduction right where you are going to do a division in this also uh, there will be anabolic reaction what is going to involve in the production of different types of biomolecules so all these activities are uh, completely being regulated by the biomolecules 
at the molecular levels, right? Uh, and uh, in this particular module, we are actually going to go through with the, some of the basic properties of these biomolecules. So, uh, what are the different biomolecules we are going to cover uh, in this particular module? So, we are going to discuss about the DNA, right, or deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, why it is important to study the DNA? Because DNA is a source of the genetic information. Uh, this is anyway we are going to discuss when we discuss about the genomic DNA and other kinds of aspects of molecular biology. But uh, for time being, you can imagine that the DNA is actually the genetic material, right? Because uh, when we will discuss about the genetic material, we will, you will understand that that time we are going to discuss about the different types of experiments. Uh, which are actually going to uh, give you the idea that why the DNA is a genetic material. Then DNA will go through with the activity which is called as replications and with the help of the replications one DNA copy right will actually going to form the two DNA copy right and uh, remember that when we talk about when we'll discuss about the replications we'll discuss about the uh, replications in uh, prokaryotic system and as well as replication in the eukaryotic systems and then dna is also going to participate into the activities which are called as transcription right so d from dna it is actually going to generate the rna and rna is going to have the same amount of information what the dna is and this process is known as the transcription which is actually going to perform by the rna polymerase a dna to dna is actually going to be catalyzed by the DNA polymerase. Now, once from DNA, you are actually going to synthesize the RNA, uh, RNA or the ribonucleic acid, right? It is actually going to participate into translation, right? Translation, which is actually going to be responsible for production of protein. So, RNA alone is not responsible you are going to have the help of the other protein molecules to form the uh, ribosomes and other machinery and then ultimately it is actually going to produce the protein. From the RNA once you produce the protein and protein is very important because it is a building block for most of the biological system right. For example, we have the different types of proteins. So we can have the protein which is building blocks like collagen we can have the proteins as building block like uh, uh, actin right uh, myosin which is actually being responsible for production uh, generation of muscles and because of these actin and myosin fibers you can be able to walk and you can be able to run right so it's not only that it is actually going to be a building block. For example, the collagen is actually the main fiber responsible for production or for the generation of the different types of bones because the uh, collagen is going to be uh, going to be calci calcified, and that's how it is actually going to produce the different types of uh, uh, different types of uh, bones, right? Hairs, like for example, the keratin, right, and uh, other things, right? Now, apart from that, enzyme, uh, the protein can also be an uh, enzyme, right? So, enzyme is actually, I am keeping in a different category. So, enzymes are within the protein, they can also be an enzyme. And what is the function of the enzyme? Enzyme is actually going to participate in running the metabolism of the organisms. What is mean by the metabolism is that it is actually going to run the catabolic reactions and the anabolic reactions. All these anabolic and catabolic reactions are actually going to be catalyzed by the different types of enzyme. Apart from that, and what is the purpose of these? It is actually going to be responsible for the energy production. Apart from that, the enzymes are very actively being participate into the three ma major uh, uh, processes what are happening in the cell. What are these processes? Uh, these processes are called as the replication followed by transcription followed by translation and all these are central uh, pathways are actually being governed by the enzyme apart from that the enzymes are also being playing crucial role into the molecular cloning 
so in this particular uh, module uh, when we'll talk about the enzyme we are actually going to discuss about the basic properties of the enzyme and then we are not going to talk about the enzyme kinetics and other kinds of aspects of enzyme because that you can easily be able to go through or that you can actually be able to study in a other kind of MOOCs courses like for example I also have a, another MOOCs course called Enzyme Science and Technology and if you want to study that part then you can actually be able to study uh, using this particular uh, MOOCs course right so there is a MOOCs course which is called as Enzyme Science and Technology which deals in detail about the uh, enzyme related kinetics how you can be able to stall the structures and blah 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 like that so that we are not covering in this particular module what we are covering is what basic properties of the enzyme and then we are going to talk about the specific properties of the enzyme which are um, you know going to play crucial role in the uh, molecular biology related uh, activities like uh, replication transcription and translation and the enzymes which are part of the molecular cloning. So let's first start our discussion about the uh, DNA, right? So DNA is a nucleic acid, right? It is a deoxyribonucleic acid. So it's a deoxyribonucleic acid. You can have the two different types of nucleic acid. So and as I said, you know, DNA is the major molecule which is responsible for carrying the genetic information from the one generation to another generation. And this all you are actually going to uh, learn when we are going to uh, discuss about the genomic DNA and genetic information, uh, the gen gen genetic material actually. So most of the organisms, whether it is a prokaryotic organism or a eukaryotic organism has DNA as a genetic material, whereas minor fractions such as some of the viruses like the uh, coronavirus or other kinds of HIV and all that has RNA as a genetic material. So mostly the nucleic acid is going to serve as the genetic material. So whether it is the DNA or RNA. DNA or RNA is a biopolymer and it is acidic in nature, right? And that's why the nucleic acid is acidic in nature, right? In eukaryotic cell, animal or the plant, the nucleic acid is present within the nucleus, right? Whereas in prokaryotic cell, it is present as the free from into the cytosol. And, uh, uh, and that's why the, the, you know that the, we have discussed about the different the differences between the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. And one of the major differences is that the, uh, that the nucleic acid, which is uh, present within the nucleus uh, in the case of eukaryotes, whereas it is going to be present outside as a free form into the cytosol. The first nucleic acid was isolated by a scientist known as Frederick Mischer in the year 1868 right and since then we will actually discovering the new and new properties of this particular molecule now what is the composition of the dna right so the the nucleic acid is composed of the three components you can have the phosphoric acid you can have the base and you can also have the sugar the phosphoric acid provides the backbone to the polymer, whereas the sugar works as an anchoring point for the nitrogenous bases. The nine-membered nitrogenous bases give the diversity in the sequence of the nucleic acid. So these are the three different components. You can have the sugar, right? So you can have the uh, two different types of sugar. So uh, we can have the ribose in the case of RNA, right? So we can have the ribose in the case of RNA or we can have the two deoxyribose in the case of DNA because these are the and remember that there's only one difference that two prime OH is present in RNA whereas that two prime OH is missing in the case of DNA and then you can also have the phosphate right so the phosphate is actually working as a backbone right so phosphate is running throughout right and in this phosphate you actually having the uh, you know the sugar molecule which is attached to this and that sugar molecule is working as an anchorage point for the different types of nitrogenous bases 
so you can have the nitrogenous bases which are belonging to the pyrimidine or you can have the nitrogenous bases which are belonging to the purines so uh, forget uh, talking about the components so phosphate backbone so phosphoric acid serves as the backbone of the molecule so you can have the two different chains one is phosphate backbone on this side the other is having the phosphate backbone on this side then you can also have the sugar so you can have the five member sugar either it can be a ribose or the deoxyribose so in the dna you can have the deoxyribose where the two prime oh is missing so the five membered cyclic uh, reducing sugar is present in the nucleic acid these are the two different variants the sugar molecule which contains the hydroxyl group at 3 prime as known as ribose uh, whereas it is deoxyribose if it is absent okay uh, based on the sugar the nucleic acid is classified either the rna or the dna ribose sugar is present in rna whereas deoxyribose sugar is present in dna the purpose of sugar in the nucleic acid is to provide the attachment point for the nitrogen basis so this is a sugar and it is actually going to have the attachment point so that you can have the nitrogen basis attached to sugar so this is the phosphate backbone on this you are going to have the sugar molecule and on this sugar molecule you are going to have the base right and that's how it is going to be have the same way it is going to be on this side and that's how they are actually actually interacting with each other this anyway you are we are going to discuss in detail when we discuss about the base pairing and other kinds of things uh, and then the the nitrogenous base so there are two variants there are nine membered conjugated double bond system right and there are two variants one is purine the other one is called as pyrimidine pyrimidine so purine such as adenine and guanine the six membered single ring system which is called as pyrimidine so these are called thymine uracil and the cytosine so this is the adenine which is a nine membered ring and then you also have the another nine membered ring which is called as guanine so these are the nine membered ring or i will say two ring uh, uh, base right so if you have two rings it is going to be purine if it is a single ring then it is going to be pyrimidine okay so pyrimidine is going to be either the thymine cytosine or the uracil okay whereas for the purines it is going to be two member two two rings and the pyrimidine it is going to be one ring okay and uh, the presence of nitrogenous base in dna rna is predetermined for example the dna has adenine guanine thymine and cytosine and it does not contain the uracil okay uh, whereas the rna has adenine guanine uracil and cytosine and strictly no thymine okay uh, now the question comes if you have the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, uh, why there is a strict or why what is what is the base pairing? Why, why, why which one will actually going to make the base pair with others and so on? So what is the rule about having the base pairing between these nitrogenous uh, bases, right? So uh, the DNA is double stranded, where RNA is single stranded right in most of the cases rna can be double stranded in some of the uh, plant viruses and some of the other special organisms who are actually going to have the rna as double stranded but mostly the double e dna is actually going to be double stranded the individual monomer responsible for making dna or rna is nucleotide and as a result the dna or rna can be considered as polynucleotide molecule so they are polymers actually similarly just like you know the sugar is a polymer of the glucose molecule similarly you can actually have the dna which is a polymer of the nucleotides and that's why it is called as the polynucleotides uh, in a polynucleotide you can and and what is there in the individual nucleotide so individual nucleotide is having a nucleoside attached to one or more phosphate group and can be termed as the uh, if it is if it is attached to the one phosphate group then it is called as monophosphate nucleoside if it is attached to the two phosphate group then it is called as diphosphate nucleoside 
and if it is conducted to the three phosphate group then it is called as triphosphate nucleotides so this, this is what it is actually going to show so if the sugar is attached to the base if sugar is attached to the base then it is called as nucleoside okay so if the sugar is plus base then it is called as nucleoside okay now if nucleoside is attached to the one molecule of phosphate then it is it is going to be called as nucleoside monophosphate or i will say nucleoside okay then if it is attached to the two phosphate groups then it is going to be called as nucleoside diphosphate or if it is attached to the three phosphate group then it is going to be called as nucleoside triphosphate okay and uh, the base is attached to the sugar uh, molecule with the help of the glycosidic glycosidic bond if the 2 prime oh is present then it is going to be called as ribose if the 2 prime oh is absent then it is going to be called as uh, deoxy ribose uh, each nucleoside is composed of the nitrogenous base attached to the sugar through the uh, glycosidic bonds so when the nucleoside is going to be attached to the phosphate then it is also going to be called as nucleotide okay so when the attached with phosphate then it is actually going to be called as nucleotide okay so nucleotide monophosphate nucleotide uh, diphosphate nucleotide triphosphate now nucleotide has the free hydroxyl group at the if the nucleotide has a free hydroxyl group at 3 prime carbon and a phosphate group at the 5 prime of the sugar right this is what is going to show right so it has actually the 5 prime phosphate and actually going to have the 3 prime oh right and that's actually provide the uh, some kind of uh, the uh, some kind of the orientation or polarity into the molecule right so the first nucleotide has the free phosphate group and the three hydroxyl group which are going to make the bond with the phosphate group at the five prime of the next nucleotide so this one is actually going to make a bond with the phosphate group by uh, the su subsequent uh, nucleotides right and that that will continue right so that's why you are actually going to have the five prime free phosphate group on one end and when it ends then you are actually going to have the three point free OH groups at the other end and that's why it actually provides the uh, polarity into the molecule so the the propagation of the nucleotide along the length of the chain give rise the polynucleotide as a result of each polynucleotide chain has the free five prime phosphate group on first nucleotide and the free three hydro three prime hydroxyl group on the last nucleotide so this is the uh, first nucleotide on which you are actually going to have the five prime free phosphate group because it is not attached to anybody right so your this phosphate group is free right and on the last phosphate uh, nucleotide this end this phosphate the sugar what is attached right it's actually going to have the uh, free phosphate uh, OH group right on the 3 prime OH it gives the polarity to the polynucleotide chain and it runs in the direction from the 5 prime to the 3 prime so because of the simplicity and to make the things more systematic uh, we actually call this as running from the 5 prime to the 3 prime because 5 prime you are actually going to have the phosphate group and on the 3 prime you are actually going to have the OH because so basically if you want to extend this growth you are actually going to extend on this side not on this side because this side it is already been blocked by the 5 prime phosphate group so dna is a double standard where rna is a single standard this is there are exceptions that rna could be double standard like some of the plant viruses and the animal viruses both strand of the dna are held together by the hydrogen bonding between the bases attached to the sugar right so you can have the a you can have the g you can have the t you can have the c and all these are actually having the hydrogen bonding between them so 
adenine of one chain is always making the two hydrogen bonding with the thymine of the next chain so on one side if you have the adenine on the other side if you have the thymine then it is actually going to make the hydrogen bonding of the two hydrogen bonding okay whereas in the case of the same way if you have the guanine on this side you can actually have the cytosine on this side so it is actually going to make the uh, three uh, hydrogen bonding so similarly the guanine of the one chain is making the three hydrogen bonding with the cytosine of the next chain now the question comes why the adenine is making a pair with thymine and why the guanine is making a pair with cytosine okay what is what is unique about this base pairing right it is possible that adenine can make a pair with cytosine and guanine is making a pair with cyto, uh, uh, thymine right but that does not happen right because of that there is a strict base pairing that adenine is always making a pair with thymine and guanine is always making a pair with cytosine so the question comes why there is a such a strict base pairing and that strict base pairing the answer to this strict base pairing comes from the uh, their structure itself right so you know that the adenine is adenine and guanine are the two ring structure right and the thymine and cytosine is one ring structure right this means they are small these are big okay now you actually uh, so and apart from that the groups what are attached to the adenine and guanine are actually different than the group what is present on the thymine and cytosine and you know for hydrogen bonding right uh, it is this uh, this kind of uh, stoichiometry and the distances are very important so why there is a base pairing uh, of such a strict base pairing that adenine is going to make a pair with thymine and the guanine is always making a pair with cytosine so question lies uh, uh, within the their structure and as well as the uh, groups what are present onto the their uh, uh, their uh, uh, rings actually right so adenine or guanine is a purine and it is a nine membered ring nine membered means it is actually having the two rings whereas the thymine or cytosine is a pyrimidine which is a six membered ring so this means a one ring structure okay so presence of both presence of both purines such mean which means adenine and guanine right uh, which are bulky actually so there are two rings right so they are actually bulky so if you put the adenine on one side and guanine on the other side it is actually going to have the steric hindrance it is actually going to having the not enough space between the dna strands right and because of that they will be actually going to be too wide actually so they are actually going to be too wide to get accommodated within the dna structures right because the distances between the two strand of the dna is uh, going to be very strict right so they are not going to vary uh, in in comparison to that for example if you have two pyrimidines for example the cytosine and thymine then the cytosine and thymine are very small so they will not they will be placed very far away and then they will not actually going to have any kind of hydrogen bonding so hydrogen bonding is not going to be possible if the pyrimidine in pyrimidine is present because the pyrimidine is actually going to be very small because it's a single ring structure so they will not be able to interact with each other and because of that the dna structure is going to be unstable at this particular region right so if they will not be able to interact this region can be broken very easily and it is actually going to form the loops and other kinds of bulbs right the only combination what is possible is if you have the purine on one side then you should have the pyrimidine on the other side which means if you have the uh, adenine on this side then you can actually have the thymine on this side so in that case the distances are also fine so if you have this combination it is actually going to manage the distance because then the distance between the groups are going to be consistent whether the you have the bulky on this side and small one on this side or you have the 
bulky on this side and the small one on this side doesn't matter the distance is going to remain the same so that is it is not going to distort it is not going to destroy the dna structure the apart from that the groups what are going to be present on to the purine is actually going to place the groups in such a way that they are actually going to interact and they are going to form the hydrogen bonding with the groups what is present on to the pyrimidines so this way uh, it, the most possible uh, combination is that the purine on one side and the pyrimidine on the other side this means the amount of purine amount of purine could be or is actually equivalent to the amount of pyrimidine right this way anyway we are going to discuss in detail right so uh, if you have the two purines it is difficult because they are bulky if you have two pyrimidines they are small so they will be it will be too small to form the hydrogen bonding and in so the only combination would be that if you have the purine on one side and the pyrimidine on the other side and then it is actually going to have the perfect match for hydrogen acceptor and the donor side which are present onto the purine and pyrimidine so that's why there is a strict base pairing uh, two chains and that's why the two chains are called as complementary to each other which means if you know the sequence on one ch chain you can actually be able to predict the structure on the second chain and that's why they are actually complementary to each other now the question comes what is complementarity mean to you right what is complementarity right so it means that if i will provide you the sequence of nucleotide on the one strand right if you I, if i provide you the information about the nucleotide sequence on the strand one it will let you to predict very precisely the sequence of the nucleotide on the other hand because a wherever you have a it is actually going to interact with t and wherever you have g it is actually going to interact with c right let's take this with an example right so for every appearance of a you are actually going to give the t and for every appearance of g you are going to take the c let's take an example for example this is the strand one on which you are actually know the sequence right and if you want to know the sequence of the complementary strand so this is going to be the strand number 2 remember that the strands are not only going to be complementary in terms of the sequence they are also going to be complementary in terms of the polarity for example the strand 1 is running in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime this means it is running in this direction this means the complementary strand should run in this direction this means the 5 prime is going to be on this side and it will go run in this direction this kind of information is very important and this aspect and concept is very important for you to understand because it is actually going to be used extensively when we are actually going to discuss about the replication and transcription because that time this complementary information and the concept of complementarity is very very important to understand so let's see so strand 1 you have the adenine you have thymine you have guanine guanine cytosine cytosine so the first nucleotide if you go to the first nucleotide it is adenine so what i'll do is i'll put the thymine if it is a thymine then i'll put the adenine if it is guanine i will put the cytosine if it is guanine i will put cytosine well cytosine i will put guanine like that okay and that's how you can be able to have the generation of the second strand okay and since it is starting from the 5 prime i will put the 3 prime okay because as i said the strands are complementary to each other not only in terms of sequence but also in terms of the polarity so the individual strand of the dna runs in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime and on the other strand runs in the direction of 3 prime to 5 prime hence both strands are running in a anti parallel direction to maintain the base complementarity the presence of complementarity in base pairing and running of strand in the anti parallel direction allows the precise duplication of dna through a process known as replication and this is all we are actually going to discuss in detail when we are going to talk about the replications so remember that 
this is the five prime of sugar and this is the strand one right and all these are the nucleotides so this is the base what is attached and then it is actually interacting with the so this is a uh, adenine interacting with the thymine and this side this is a strand one so this is the strand one and this is running in from the, in this direction, right? And whereas this is a strand two, where it is running in the opposite direction, okay? And remember that uh, the uh, if you have adenine on this side, you're going to have thymine on this side. Now, let's talk about the uh, some of the uh, rules what is related to this complementity. So understanding the base pairing requirement, the Chargaff has proposed a rule about composition of DNA. The summary of this rule is as follows. Point number one, the purines and pyrimidines are always going to be in an equal quantity, which means the amount of purines is going to be equal to the amount of pyrimidines. And this is understandable because Whatever the amount of purine is going to be present on strand number one, it is actually going to be present on the same amount of pyrimidine on the other strand. And that's why if you uh, take the composition of the total DNA, the amount of purine is going to be equal to the pyrimidine. Okay? Because A is making a pair with T and G is making a pair with C. Right? The amount of adenine is equal to the thymine and the amount of cytosine is equal to the guanine which means a is going to be equal to the t and g is going to be equal to the c right not only that the base ratio which means a plus t divided by g plus c may vary from one species to another but it will remain constant for a given species and this is a very very important information because if you calculate the a t by g c ratio you can be able to say very precisely what is the species of you can actually be able to identify the species of that particular organism because as i said you know it will vary from one species to another species but it will remain constant for a given species so he proposed uh, that uh, these ratio can be used to identify the species and you can actually be able to use this information to classify them. Now, number four, the deoxyribose sugar and the phosphate component occurs in the equal proportions. Uh, now, the question comes, if the DNA is double stranded, how it can be denatured to access the information of the nucleotide sequence? So, DNA double helix can be broken open if it is exposed to the high temperature or titrate with the acid or alkali. Remember that the DNA strands are attached to each other with the help of the hydrogen bonding, right? So this hydrogen bonding can be broken by two things. Either you add something which is more polar, uh, such as uh, you change the pH, right? Or you add salt, right? If you add the salt, the salt will actually interact with the base pairs and it's actually going to break. Other point is if you heat, right, if you heat, if you increase the temperature, the heat is actually going to break the hydrogen bonding between the bases. During this process, the hydrogen bonding between the two strand breaks and this process is known as the melting or the denaturation of the DNA. When the denatured DNA is incubated at low temperature, the separated strands reassociate re to form the duplex DNA. This process is known as the renaturation. And this is very important concept to understand that when you are going to heat the DNA, the two strands are actually going to be get depart, right? They, because the hydrogen bonding between the bases is actually going to be broken. So they will actually going to get separated. And when you are actually going to lower down the temperature, it is actually going to renature, right? And uh, this concept is very uh, effectively being used uh, when you are talking about the uh, technique which is called as polymerase chain reaction or so uh, the denaturation or renaturation kinetics is used to understand the complexity of DNA and it has a wide application in amplifying the strand using a technique which is called as polymerase chain reactions. So uh, 
So DNA, denaturation and stability. So if you do that, what you're going to see here is that it is actually going to give you the fraction of DNA what is present as the uh, du double standard versus single standard. And if you plot this denaturation curve, you are going to get a sigmoidal curve like this. And this, info this actually is actually going to give you the information when the 50% DNA is actually being denatured, which means when the 50% DNA is present in the double standard form versus single standard form. So that is actually going to give you the TM of that particular DNA. And that TM of that particular DNA is actually going to be a very, very characteristic to that particular species. It varies between the species and it also varies if the DNA is more complex or the uh, so it varies in terms of when the complexity of the DNA will actually go up, right? And that's why this particular type of denaturation curve can be used to, um, to understand the complexity of DNA without even going through the process of sequencing. Now let's talk about how you can be able to isolate the genomic DNA from the uh, cell, right? because you are actually going to use this information if you want to uh, perform these kind of experiments like where you are actually going to understand the complexity of DNA and all other kinds of things. So what you are going to do is you are going to, so we are not getting into the detail of the protocol like how you are going to put the different types of reagents and all that. What you're going to do is first you're going to light the cell with the different detergents uh, containing so that it will actually going to prepare the lyse the cells. So you're going to lyse the cells. And uh, once you have the lysate, right, so it's actually going to contain uh, DNA. It's actually going to contain the DNA and also going to contain the protein and it's also going to contain the minor quantity of lipids, right, because it's going to have the lipids from the plasma membrane. So these are the three biomolecules what is going to be present in this particular uh, lysate, right? Then what you're going to do is, and DNA is actually going to be present in complex with protein because uh, you know that the DNA is always making a pair, uh, making a complex with protein because DNA is negatively charged. So it binds the positively charged histones and that's how it's actually going to be packed within the nucleus. This all we are going to discuss in detail when we talk about or when we discuss about the genomic in, uh, DNA in detail, right? When we're going to talk about the genetic material. So then uh, the second step is you're going to do uh, enzymatic digestions. So you're going to treat the cells with the digestion buffer, right? And that digestion buffer is actually going to contain the protease, which is called as protease K and the SDS and uh, it is actually going to release the genomic DNA from the DNA protein complex. Then you are actually going to precipitate or isolate the genomic DNA by the alcohol precipitation. So you're going to in the third step, you're going to precipitate the genomic DNA by the absolute alcohol. And uh, after that, you are actually going to get the DNA and as well as uh, protein and as well as the lipids. So then you are actually going to do the purification step. So you're going to extract the things with the help of the chloroform and uh, phenol chloroform isoML solutions. And when you do that, you are actually going to get the two phases. You are going to get the aqueous phase and you are actually going to get the organic phase. In the organic phase, you are actually going to have the proteins, uh, whereas, or the lipids, whereas in the aqueous phase, you are actually going to have the DNA or the genomic DNA actually. And then you can collect this and again you are going to precipitate the DNA with the help of the absolute alcohol and that's how you are actually going to get the uh, pure mammalian DNA. If you analyze this genomic DNA onto a agarose gel, uh, we are not discussing about uh, the agarose gel in this particular uh, course. What you will see here is that it is actually going to run as an intact band right and it will run very close to well actually this is the well where you have loaded actually why it is so because the genomic dna is very big and it is actually coiled right so it is actually going to be slow run very slowly so genomic dna is actually going to be analyzed on 0.28 percent agarose and a good preparation of genomic dna gives an intact band 
with no visible smears. Now, once you isolated the genomic DNA, right? You isolated the genomic DNA. Uh, you are actually should do the estimation. You should know what is the amount of DNA what you have isolated, right? So, if you want to isolate the genomic DNA, you have two choices. One, you can actually have the absorb take the absorbance at 280 nanometer. Or the other is you can actually be able to do the colorimetric method, right? So you can actually do the uh, absorbance at 280 nanometer. So what you can do is you can take the small amount of DNA and then you actually add the buffer, right? So you can actually be able to, so what you do is, uh, and you know that the DNA is absorbing very strongly at 260 nanometer and uh, RNA also, right? So RNA and DNA both absorb very strongly at 260 nanometer. So what you can do is you can take the buffer and uh, first take the absorbance at 260 nanometer and that is going to be uh, the control reading or I will say blank, right? So it is actually going to be considered as zero reading and then what you do is you add the buffer and you add the small amount of DNA. For example, add the two microliter of DNA. And again, I will take the absorbance. So it is actually going to show me the absorbance of, for example, uh, 0.15, right? So this is the absorbance, what I got at 260 nanometer. And I can just convert this and get the concentration of DNA, okay? So uh, that you can do uh, in a spectrophotometer or you can actually be able to use the nanotropes. So we have prepared a small demo clip and uh, where the students are actually going to show you a, uh, a small demo clip so that you can be able to determine the DNA concentration with the help of the absorbance at 280 nanometer. Today we are going to estimate DNA concentration using UV visible spectroscopy. One of the most common methods for DNA concentration detection is the measurement of solution absorbance at 260 nanometer due to the fact that nucleic acids have an absorp absorption maximum at this wavelength. For this experiment we need DNA for standard cup preparation, distilled water, DNA sample of unknown concentration, micropipettes, tips, cuvette and spectrophotometer. According to this table, we will prepare different concentrations of DNA solution for the standard cup. After preparing different concentration of DNA solution, we will measure the absorbance at 260 nanometer using spectrophotometer. We will take the absorbance of the blank. Now we will take the absorbance for the 5 microgram per ml concentration. These are the absorbance values. From the absorbance value, we have plotted the graph and we have got the regression equation. Our absorbance for unknown sample was 0.478 and this value is the value of the y. Substituting the y value in the regression equation and solving it will give the x value which is our unknown concentration that is 22.319 microgram per ml. Now the second method is you can actually be able to do the DNA estimation with the help of the colorimetric method and that method is called as estimation of DNA by the uh, diflamine reactions. So diflamine is a, is a colorimetric reagent so when it reacts with DNA. So if it is reacts with diflamine, it is actually going to give you the blue colored, uh, blue colored complex and that blue colored complex you can actually be able to uh, you know, uh, give you the absorbance and that is actually can be used for determining the total DNA content what is present. Now, the question comes why we are doing this instead of the absorbance at uh, 260 nanometer. Uh, 
the question the answer to this question is that the absorbance at 260 nanometer is a quick method uh, and it actually gives you the uh, quite reliable results but it is not very very quantitative it will not going to give you the absolute correct answer right and that's why we we there is a colorimetric method in case you want to verify because if you are doing at 260 nanometer absorbance uh, there are other molecules which also can contribute into the uh, into the uh, reactions. So, what is the principle of theta alkylamine reactions? So, the deoxyribose, the sugar part, right, in DNA is in the presence of acid forms the beta hydroxylevonaldehyde, which reacts with the diphenylamine to give a blue colored complex, which is shock of absorbance at 595 nanometer in DNA only the deoxyribose of the purine nucleotide reacts. So, the value what you are going to obtain represent the half of the total uh, deoxyribose. So, what you have is you have a DNA, DNA has the uh, pyrimidines right and, uh, and the purines also right. So, when you are going to pit them into the uh, into the acidic reactions right it is actually going to uh, have the purines and then you are also going to have the sugar part. This sugar in the presence of sulfuric acid it is actually going to react with the diphenylamine to form the uh, beta hydroxylivinoaldehyde right and then the beta hydroxylivinoaldehyde is actually going to react with the diphenylamine and the diphenylamine is actually going to give you the blue colored complex and this blue colored complex is going to absorb very strongly at 595 nanometer. Uh, what are the metallurgy, right? The material requires you actually requires the spectrophotometer and a water bath. So you require a, a boiling water bath, right? Remember that you actually require a water bath which actually can maintain a hundred degrees Celsius. Then you require the chemicals. So you require the standard DNA solutions, determine the agents, DNA sample, right? Uh, you require the uh, citrate buffers, you require the acetic acid, concentrated sulfuric acid and ethanol. Uh, the glasswares, you require a test tube, pipettes and graduated cylinder. Then the procedures, so you are actually going to prepare the reagents. So you are going to prepare the diphenylamine reagents and uh, while you are preparing the diphenylamine reagents, remember that these are the reagents where you are actually going to have the glacial acetic acid and you are also going to have the concentrated sulfuric acid. So, you should be taking very careful, very a lot of cares and the reagent has to be stored in a dark glass bottle. So, on the day of use, you prepare a fresh solution of methanol and uh, you are going to add the things into like uh, 1 ml of methanol in the 50 ml of water and you add the 0.5 ml of the solution to each 100 ml of the diphenylamine reactions. Uh, you have to always be very cautious right because you are actually going to deal with the uh, you know the concentrated sulfuric acid and concentrated glacial stick acid. So, you always you are the IV, IVR protections and you use the fume cobalt for these reagents. And diphenylamine reagent is also very harmful. So, if ingested or inhaled, may irritate the skin or eyes and it comes out into the contact with them. Now, you are going to set up the assay. So, you are going to prepare a series of dilution of a standard DNA starting from the 0.25 mg per ml stock in a saline, saline citrate buffer to give a concentration of 50 to 500 microgram per ml. You prepare all the reagent sample in triplicates. Then to 2 ml of each of these blank, standard and unknown, you add the 4 ml of diethylamine reagent and mix. Tube 1 is used as a blank and tube 2 through 7 are used as a concentration of a standard calibration curve, whereas tube 8 to 11 are for the unknown samples. This anyway you are going to see in the table, right? Then you incubate all the um, uh, tubes into a boiling water bath for 10 minutes, cool the temperature and read the absorbance at 595 nanometer. Then you can actually be able to make a calibration curve of the absorbance at 595 nanometer versus the concentration of the DNA. And uh, this is the table, this is the uh, recipe table what you are going to use. So, the first reaction is actually the blank reaction where you have not added the DNA. So, this is the minus DNA uh, uh, reaction. So, this is actually going to be the blank. So, whatever the reaction you are going to, whatever the values you are going to get that has to be subtracted from this value, right. 
So this is the value what you are going to get, right? This is the average of this and this value has to be subtracted and when you do that, you are actually going to get, this is the corrected absorbance value at 525 nanometer. And uh, these are the uh, standard reactions what you are going to use, right? And uh, these are the unknown samples. So DNA what is present in the unknown samples. And then using these reactions, using these values, you can be able to curve, make a calibration curve. And uh, using this calibration curve, you can be able to determine the DNA concentrations into the unknown samples. So this is the standard curve what you are going to prepare, where you are going to have the corrected absorbance value onto the y-axis, right? This is the y-axis and the concentration of the DNA or amount of DNA onto the x-axis and then you are going to get the calibration curve and you can actually be having two options either you use the equations and you can be able to determine the concentration of the unknown samples right or you can actually be able to use this calibration curve to determine the calibration uh, the, uh, the unknown samples so to show you all these we have prepared a small demo and uh, with this small demo you can be able to understand how to prepare these reactions and what are the different places where you are supposed to take the precautions because you are dealing with the corrosive uh, samples so you should be very very careful hello everyone in this video we are going to demonstrate how to estimate the concentration of dna using the diphenyl amine method the basic principle in this method is that the deoxyribose in dna of the purine nucleotide uh, in the presence of uh, a sulfuric acid is going to form beta hydroxy levinol dehyde uh, that uh, in turn going to react with the diphenyl amine forming a blue colored complex uh, with uh, absorbance at 595 nanometer. Uh, so in this method, the materials which will be requiring are the uh, standard DNA solution prepared in citrate uh, buffer of 250 microgram per ml, the diphenyl amine reagent, the saline citrate buffer, the test tubes uh, for the standard uh, curve preparation of six standards, three unknowns, as well as the one for the blank. And also, we will be needing the hot uh, water bath, as well as the spectrophotometer for the uh, absorbance. So, coming to the procedure, uh, to prepare the st standard curve, we need to add the known concentration of DNA in each of the standard tube. So, in standard 1, we will be adding 50 microgram of DNA. In uh, standard 2, 100 microgram of DNA. In standard 3, 200 microgram of DNA. In standard 4, 300 microgram of DNA. In standard 5, 400 microgram of DNA. And in standard 6, 500 microgram of DNA. So, to add this particular concentration of DNA in each of the test tube, uh, we need to, uh, we, we have already had the standard DNA solution of 250 microgram per ml. So, for 50 uh, microgram of uh, DNA to be added in standard 1, we need to add 200 microliter of the standard DNA solution with 1800 microliter of water into the standard 1 test tube. So, likewise, for 100 all, and 200 and uh, for 100, 200, 300 like that, we will be adding the DNA, known DNA concentration along with the distilled water to make up the volume 2 by ml in each of the standard test tube. So now we will be adding the known concentration of DNA into each of the standard test tube. So for the standard one, we will be adding 200 microliter of standard DNA solution of 250 microgram per ml to make it into a, a known concentration of 50 microgram and we will be adding the distilled water to make up the concentration of 2 ml.
likewise for other standard tubes with the known concentration of dna we will be making up to 2 ml in each of the standard now after tubes. preparing the known concentration of the dna in each of the standards along with the unknown now we will be adding the 4 ml of dpa reagent to each of the test tube including the blank likewise we are going to add to all of the standards as well as the unknown to make up a total volume of 6 ml in each of the test tube now we have added the dpa reagent of 4 ml each in all of the test tubes now for adding we are going to incubate all of the test tubes in hot water bath that we are going to put for 10 minutes after incubating the samples for 10 minutes at 100 degree centigrade now we need to let the samples to cool down to room temperature now we could see the blue colored complex formed in the standards as well as in the unknowns so taking from the standard 1 to 6 we could see as the concentration was increasing the intensity of the blue color was also increasing now to record the absorbance we need to check at 595 nanometer in the spectrophotometer now we are going to measure the absorbance at 595 nanometer using the spectrophotometer so this is the spectrophotometer device where we are having two crate holders one is for the blank other is for the test samples so first we need to set the absorbance at 595 nanometer and i'm going to take the blank in one of the coil place it in the holder next we are going to take the standard one in another coil and place it in the another coil holder this would be constant and for the uh, standards we would be changing from second third to till the unknown samples now i'll be measuring here are the absorbance values taken twice for each of the sample including the unknowns to reduce the error percentage by taking the average of two values The last column gives us the corrected OD after nullifying the blank from each of the standards and unknown samples. Now, by plotting the standard curve with absorbance on y-axis and quantity of DNA on x-axis, we have determined the unknown concentration of DNA using the equation of slope. Here, the obtained concentration is usually half. since the purine nucleotides only forms the blue colored complex after reaction with the diphenylamine reagent in the presence of strong acid so doubling the obtained concentration for each unknown gives us the actual concentration of dna like for unknown 1 it is around 0.4 microgram so by doubling it we get around 0.8 microgram
So uh, this is all about the uh, the DNA. We have uh, some more aspects what is related to the uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, which we are going to discuss in our subsequent uh, subsequent lectures. Thank you. Mm -hmm.